So, yes, hello everyone. Uh, so, Danica and I are going to talk about recent updates to the Oxford English Dictionary, which documents the language of COVID-19. And, yeah, thanks Danica. Um, so, we're going to be talking about uh, new additions, um, new, new entries added to the OED, such as COVID-19, social distancing, our number and so on, and the updating of existing entries. So, I'm going to start by discussing the different types of neologisms and other lexical innovations that we've been tracking based on analysis of our monitor corpus of English. And then Danica will talk specifically about how we've been analysing COVID-related vocabulary in different varieties of English. So some of the lexical innovations that we saw during COVID were completely new words or neologisms. And the most notable of these was, of course, COVID-19 itself. It was remarkable how quickly this word skyrocketed in frequency. It was coined in February 2020, and by April 2020, when we added it to the OED, it was one of the top five nouns in our corpus data for that month. It just completely dominated discourse. Normally, we wait a while before adding new words to the OED, we maybe wait a few years um, to see if they last, but this was obviously an exception. And then pretty much immediately COVID-19 was shortened to COVID and we added a separate entry for that. And those have been the most significant neologisms, but there are plenty of other ones that we've been monitoring. These include uh, clippings or shortenings denoting COVID-19 or coronavirus, um, like Corona, Rona, and C19. And in particular, there have been a lot of um, blends and compounds coined during the pandemic, some quite playful, some more serious, and we've probably all read articles online listing these. COVID and Corona um, have been particularly productive elements, um, especially in covid and also in more ephemeral formations like COVID divorces, divorces prompted by the stress of lockdown, or more positively, coronials, generation of baby, babies born during lockdown. As Zoom became ubiquitous, there were lots of coinages like Zoom bombing, Zoom ready, zumping, Zoom fatigue, and so on. More seriously, there have been various coinages formed with demic, like twin demic, referring to a hypothetical pair of pandemics occurring at the same time, um, and skeptical formations like scamdemic and pandemic. And there have been many other blends, um, a few of which I've, I've listed here, like pansession, askne, and so on. But many of these are likely to be quite short-lived and have not yet been added to the OED. We'll keep tra tracking them using our corpus and see if any become significant enough to add. So those are some of the neologisms we've been monitoring, but many of the lexical developments during the pandemic have not been completely new words. And I'll now turn to some of the other um, words that we've added or updated. Just to give an overview, this table shows the top 10 keywords in our monitor corpus in the first half of 2020. Um, keywords in this sense refers to words that, are, that um, are significantly more frequent in one part of a corpus than in the corpus as a whole. And um, so in this case, these are the words that were particularly uh, frequent in the given months. I've highlighted the COVID related ones in red. Um, and as you can see, COVID-19 and COVID are the main actual neologisms. The others are words with a longer history like lockdown, pandemic, uh, furlough, covering and distancing. And in these cases, the increased significance of the word might indicate that it's being used um, in a new sense, nuance, context, and so on. And we use lists like these to check against our coverage in the dictionary and see if there's anything we need to add or update. So one of the entries we added to the OED at the beginning of the pandemic was social distancing. As you can see from this chart, this saw an enormous increase in usage. Um, its frequency was negligible before 2020. And then by April 2020, it was occurring around about uh, 250 times for every million tokens in our corpus, which is roughly the same frequency um, as the word food. But social distancing isn't completely new. And we researched this word for the OED, consulting databases of books, newspapers, journals, and so on. We found that it goes back to 1957. And this uh, general sense of uh, maintaining remoteness or emotional separation um, from a person or group. And even the, the later sense, the more recent sense of limiting physical contact um, to avoid spreading disease goes back to 2004. 
And this is something we often find when we research a word for the OED. And I've given some other examples on the right. Um, so self-quarantine dates back to 1876, contact tracing to 1910 and so on. So these are new words to the OED, but not completely new to the language. Some were coined during previous pandemics, um, infodemic during SARS, for example, and have been revived during COVID. Another really notable feature of the language of the pandemic has been the way that scientific terms have become used in general discourse. For example, R number or reproduction number or simply R were originally terms known mainly to epidemiologists, but we now often hear non-experts talk about getting the R down and the like. This is reflected in the set of quotations in the OED entry for this sense of R. The earliest use is from the proceedings of an epidemiology conference, while the most recent example is from a news article. So again, this is not a new word, but the novelty is in the context in which it is now being used. So far, I've talked about using our corpus to identify new words to be added and updated, but corpus analysis is also, of course, essential for determining how to define, label and exemplify these words by showing how they're typically used. One of the challenges with adding extremely new words to dictionaries is that usage um, isn't necessarily fixed and there can be uncertainty about spelling or other aspects of use. I remember early on in the pandemic, there was some disagreement about the correct way to spell COVID-19. And this is the kind of information that people often turn to a dictionary for. Corpus data helps to show the most typical use. And in this case, we found that there is a lot of regional variation. The form with only capital initial is more frequent in the UK, Ireland, New Zealand and South Africa, while the all capital form is more frequent in North America, Australia and India. Following our usual style, in the OED entry, we give the most common UK form as a headword, but lists the other forms as variants. Of course, there's much more to be said about the language of COVID in different regional varieties of English, and I'll now pass over to Danica to talk about that. Uh, thanks, Kate. So in this part of our presentation, I'm going to talk about how corpus frequency data have given us useful information about the distribution of a word in different varieties of English, which we made sure to reflect in the labeling and metadata of new or revised dictionary entries. One example is the case of self-isolate, self-quarantine, and related words. We looked at various corpora to find out whether there are any region-specific preferences in the use of these words. One of the corpora we used is the coronavirus corpus, a corpus uh, which has also been uh, mentioned now um, in this conference. So it is a corpus of news articles relating to COVID-19, which clearly shows that self-quarantine is more common in the United States than in Canada, Great Britain, Ireland, Australia, and New Zealand, where self-isolate and self-isolation are preferred. A note of this effect has therefore been added to the OED's updated entry to self-quarantine verb, in recent use, in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, self-isolate and self-quarantine have often been used interchangeably with self-quarantine being more common in the United States. Another example is the word frontliner. The Oxford corpus is composed of different subcorpora representing the major varieties of English, and this enables us to make variety-specific fre frequency comparisons. This type of analysis led us to discover that although frontliner is used worldwide, it is particularly frequent in Southeast Asia, especially in the Philippines and Malaysia. In other countries, the more usual term is frontline worker or similar. For this reason, the OED entry for the relevant sense of frontliner is labeled now chiefly Southeast Asian. We have also observed some geographic variation for the names for the set of measures that many countries have taken to contain the spread of the coronavirus by severely limiting the movement of people outside the home. Lockdown is the word with the most widespread use and is the preferred term in, the country, in countries such as the UK, Canada, and Australia. In the US, the coronavirus restrictions are called shelter in place. The word ISO, short for isolation, is also used colloquially, especially in Australia and the US. In Malaysia, the initialism MCO is used, short for movement control order, while in the Philippines, ECQ is preferred, short for enhanced community quarantine. Both phrases are the official government designations for these countries' stay-at-home regulations. 
In Singapore, the term circuit breaker suddenly spiked in usage in April 2020 when it was adopted by the Singaporean government as the name for its strict quarantine measures. Most people know that a circuit breaker is a safety device that stops the flow of current in an electrical circuit, but those in the field of finance also know it as a slang term for a regulatory instrument designed to prevent panic selling by temporarily stopping trading on an exchange. It makes sense, therefore, for a global business hub such as Singapore to adapt a piece of finance slang in such a way. However, later in 2020, in September and October, Circuit Breaker also became a much used term in British English. It began to be used in the UK to refer to a short fixed term set of restrictions, Mm -hmm. which scientists recommended the government should implement in order to stem another incoming tide of coronavirus infections. Uh, Local responses to the coronavirus pandemic have also resulted in several neologisms in different varieties of English. In the Philippines, Filipinos from other regions stranded in the lockdown Manila are referred to as LSIs, short for locally stranded individuals. In Singapore, a person who needs to self-isolate is issued an SHN or stay home notice. While in India, those who wish to cross internal borders need to have an e-pass, an official government document authorizing a person's movement during quarantine. Australians say SANI for hand sanitizer, while West Africans talk of increased usage of Veronica buckets. This is a type of sanitation equipment composed of a covered bucket with a tap fixed at the bottom and a bowl fitted below it to collect wastewater, named after its Ghanaian inventor, Veronica Bickle. One Southeast Asian word gained global notoriety at the outset of the COVID-19 pandemic, and that is wet market. This term was added to the OVD in 2016. It is first attested in 1978 and was originally used only in Southeast Asian countries to refer to a market for the sale of fresh meat, fish, and produce, and is an essential part of the region's food supply chain. However, when a market in Wuhan, China was identified as ground zero for the coronavirus outbreak, people outside of Southeast Asia began to incorrectly think of wet markets as being the same as illegal wildlife markets. This subjected wet markets to much public criticism and caused a considerable increase in the usage of the word in the early months of 2020. So far, we have just we have talked about how the lexical monitoring carried out by Oxford languages lexicographers has informed the coverage of the pandemic lexicon in the OED. But this research has also had an impact on other Oxford dictionaries of current English and of other languages. So I'll now briefly describe Oxford languages multilingual COVID-19 project. As part of this initiative, key terms related to COVID-19, such as the neologisms and newly prominent words we mentioned throughout this presentation, were translated into 19 different languages. Afrikaans, Arabic, Arabic, Catalan, Chinese, Dutch, Filipino or Tagalog, French, German, Hindi, Italian, Northern Soto, Portuguese, Setswana, Spanish, Swahili, Tamil, Telugu, Xhosa, and Zulu. These translations were done by Oxford University Press editors and translators in Oxford and in its international offices in China, India, East Africa, and South Africa, so that new words and senses could be incorporated into its monolingual and bilingual dictionaries of these languages. These translations have also been made freely available as downloadable resources online, and they can be downloaded from Oxford Languages COVID-19 Language Hub at the address you see on this slide. Translating key coronavirus words into such diverse languages has also provided us with important insights into the impact of the pandemic on languages other than English. Just like with English, we see in these languages the emergence of new pandemic-related words and senses, increased use of medical and scientific terminology, and greater prominence of expressions referring to ways that the government and also individuals try to contain the spread of coronavirus and mitigate its social and economic effects. But there are also interesting differences. For example, the English word lockdown has been borrowed by several languages, including Dutch, Filipino, German, Italian, and Telugu, while other languages such as Catalan, French, Portuguese, and Spanish prefer their, you know, being Romance languages, prefer the equivalent forms for confinement. Some languages such as Arabic, Chinese, and Zulu use corresponding expressions conveying closure. 
The COVID-19 translation project has also highlighted just how much English has influenced the COVID-19 vocabulary of different languages. It is interesting that a few centuries ago, English had to borrow words from other languages um, as a response to outbreaks of disease. So, for example, the words epidemic, plague, and pestilence are all loaned words from French. But today, English is the principal language of global scientific communication, and as such, it has become the source of many of the neologisms resulting from the pandemic. Many consider the, this prevalence of Anglicisms troubling, and citizens of countries like Italy and Japan have criticized their leaders for their over-reliance on English loanwords that they feel obscures rather than strengthens their public messages. However, English influence in other languages have resulted in some notable lexical innovations. So, for example, in Italian, the word droplet has come to refer not only to the very small airborne drops of secretions from the nose, throat, or lungs by which the coronavirus can be transmitted, but it also to the distance one person must maintain from another to prevent such a transmission from happening. So our documentation of the language of COVID-19 continued throughout 2020, culminating with the words of the of an unprecedented year report. We published this expansive report on the words that define 2020 at the end of the year in place of the usual selection of a single word of the year. And the report features an entire section dedicated to COVID-19 vocabulary and can also be freely downloaded from the address on this slide. But our work did not end there. So further pandemic related additions and revisions to the dictionary have been included in the OED's regular quarterly updates in 2021. New additions include such words, face shield, essential worker, mask up and bubble. And several more words are scheduled to be published in upcoming updates. As we continue to monitor the language of COVID-19, you can follow our work on the Oxford Languages COVID-19 Language Hub this website is where you can find the translations I've just mentioned, and it also provides easy access to the insights and analysis on the impact of the coronavirus and the English lexicon that we have discussed in this presentation, including the latest OED updates and blog posts, educational resources to facilitate and support distance learning, and information and accessing OUP's dictionary content remotely. So thanks for your attention.